is the last night of a revival meeting, but not the last night of revival. Revival is not an event. It, it can just be that, but we're praying it's not just that. Revival is something that takes place in our heart, in our life, in our decisions, and then we're different as a result. And so we're praying for that. And some of you have been sharing uh, this morning, several of our men at the prayer breakfast shared that they've experienced something along those lines uh, this week. And I can just tell you personally, I've experienced something along those lines uh, this week. I certainly want to thank Pastor Bob for the uh, gracious invitation. I appreciate his friendship. I appreciate uh, his good spirit. He's been a good host. We've both been very busy. We haven't gotten to hung out as much as we wanted to. Uh, I wanted to uh, ride on his side-by-side and see some of uh, Rush Four-Wheeler. What do we call that place up there? Rush Off-Road. Wanted to see some of it. Didn't get to. So maybe I can come back sometime and uh, and, uh, hear Brother Bob preach or come back and and share some time, and I look forward uh, to that. Thank you, church. I love you in the Lord. And love some of you, just period. But love all of you in the Lord. And uh, it's good to be with you uh, tonight. Take your Bibles, turn to Philippians 3. When I think about healthy spiritual habits, now I'm going to be gone, of course, uh, in, uh, oh, in a couple hours when I finish up. Um, just making sure you're listening. A couple hours when I finish up. Uh, I'm going to be uh, leaving, heading back towards uh, Shelbyville, Kentucky. I have a full day tomorrow, meetings in E-Town tomorrow night at 6, 6 to 8. Roll back in uh, tomorrow night around 9 o'clock. And Friday is a normal day, uh, just a normal work day. So uh, that'll be an interesting day uh, in the office. I look forward to all that and uh, feel so uh, fortunate to be able to serve the Lord. But as I leave, I think about you moving forward. What will you be doing and what will you be thinking? And what might I leave with you that would help you on your spiritual journey? I've been a Christian 45 years. I'm still learning. I've got so much to learn. It seems like the more you know, you realize the more you actually don't know. Uh, There's so much. God is so big and the Bible's has so much to teach us, and and there's so much I need to learn. So we need to put some healthy spiritual habits in place in our lives so we will have ongoing revival, so we will grow in Christ, so we will mature as believers. So tonight, I want us to consider that. I believe Paul gives us some instructions there as he writes the church at Philippi. Now you know the church. Paul planted the church at Philippi on his second missionary journey. I I realize I'm kind of slanted this side tonight. Brother Bob told me this is the way Wednesday night goes. You kind of sit on this side. Uh, He comes down front. But I'm glad there's some folks who broke the mold, and they're over on this side. They're courageous. I appreciate that. So I will not ignore you over here, I promise. But uh, most of the rough crowd's over here, so I'm preaching mainly to this this crowd. Uh, You know the church, Paul planted the church on the second missionary journey. Paul and Silas had some initial problems uh, at Philippi because they cast a demon out of a fortune-telling slave girl. Now every time I've cast a demon out of a fortune-telling slave girl, I've had problems too, haven't you, Brother Bob? Every, every single time, it always happens. As a result, they were thrown in jail. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying, singing hymns to God. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake. Everyone's chains were loosed. The Philippian jailer drew his sword, was about to kill himself. Paul said, do yourself no harm, we're all here. The jailer fell down, trembling before them. You know what he said. He said what some of you need to say tonight. Sirs... What must I do to be saved? And Paul gives us the gospel in a nutshell. If you're here tonight without Christ, and you say, what do I need to hear in tonight's sermon? It's this, this small snippet of the gospel. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Paul told 
Philippian jailer that, and he was gloriously saved. Paul wrote a letter to the Philippians while he was under house arrest in Rome. Now, Paul was in and out of jail and prison many times for the sake of the gospel. On this occasion, he was under house arrest in Rome. People could come and go. This is not when he was in Rome the final time in the Mamertine prison where he eventually died for his faith. This was around A.D. 60, and he wrote to the church at Philippi to thank them for the generous gift they had sent his way, and it had been such an encouragement to him. And so he was writing them to say, thank you, that was so gracious, and I was so encouraged by your gift. Do you know people like that, someone in your life who's encouraging? Maybe it's your uncle, and when you get together at family gatherings, your uncle's just so encouraging. He asks about your life. He's concerned about you. He wants to know how things are going, how's school, how's work, how's your marriage. He's just so encouraging. Or maybe it's that favorite aunt, or, or maybe it's your grandparents, or maybe it's a friend or a co-worker. But most of us have someone in our life that we just love being around those folks because they help us to feel better about ourselves. And, and the Philippian church had been that for the Apostle Paul. That's a great reputation to have as a church. Hey, you go down there, that church will encourage you. You go down there, those folks will build you up. You go down there, those folks will love on you. Those folks will say good things about you. And they were that way to the Apostle Paul. So the Apostle Paul writes them this letter while he's in prison and in this letter he gives them some keys to healthy spiritual habits in their Christian life. So pick up with me Philippians 3 uh, verse number 7. But what things were gained to me Paul says these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. How's a person saved? Through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God by faith. You can't be good enough to go to heaven. You can only be clean and pure by placing your faith in Christ. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Now we're getting to some of my favorite verses in all of the Bible. Not that I've already attained or am already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold on me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us as many as are mature have this mind, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Do you see what Paul did there? He said, this is the way it is. And if you don't feel the same way about it, God will show you you're wrong. I'm paraphrasing, but that's what he's saying. He'll show you that I'm right on this. And then verse 16, Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us be of the same mind. Paul gives us some habits, healthy habits, that will lead to ongoing revival. The first one is that we should release, he uses the word forget, release the past. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to take hold of it. One thing I do, forgetting what is behind. Three elderly men who were staying in a nursing home had bad memory. They couldn't remember hardly anything. But they were real close friends, and they could least remember that, that they were buddies. And so the nursing home occasionally took folks to the doctor on a small van 
uh, because it was convenient to do so, and so they took these three guys together, all having serious memory issues, and the doctor knew they were close, and he said, I'll just see you all at the same time because you all have the same problem. And he said to the first man, well, let me do a little test on you. What is three times three? First man said, well, doc, that's easy. Three times three is 274. The doctor said, well, that's interesting. Uh, second man, the doctor said, what's three times three? Second man said, well, that's easy. He didn't know the answer, but three times three is Tuesday. He said, well, that's really interesting. He said to the third man, what's three times three? He said, doc, that's simple. They don't know, but I know. Three times three is nine. The doctor was a little excited, and he said, that's great, and that's right. How did you get that? He said, simple, I subtracted 274 from Tuesday. <laughs> Equals nine. They were having some memory problems. All right, we've all been there, right? Go in the other room, you think, why did I go in this room? Well, while I'm here, I think I'll just eat something. Uh, I'm, I'm hungry. Uh, we've all been there. We've all done that. Paul's not saying lose our memory. It's sad when someone loses their memory like that. It's not what Paul is saying. He's not saying that we lose the memory of the past or some event necessarily. He's saying we put the past in its proper place. We put the past behind us. In other words, we release the past. You can't go back and live tomorrow. You can't go back and live a decade ago, yes, I wasn't saved to age 14, and I wish I had come to Christ when I was about seven, when I was first under conviction, and I hate that I wasted those seven years and didn't serve the Lord those seven years, even as a young boy, but I can't go back and redo it. Those are in the past, and so I have to release those. But Paul here is not really talking about past failures. Paul is talking about, if you know the context, He's talking about past successes. He's saying, look, church, you're a good church. You've done well, and you have a good track record, but you can't live on that. That won't pay the bills. That won't fill up your belly. You, you've got to live for today and live for tomorrow. Many churches talk about the good old days. I hear it when I go around the state. Oh, back in the 50s. The good old days when we were doing this or doing that. Oh, the 60s, our church was doing so well. The 70s, the 80s, the 90s. When brother so-and-so was here. And praise the Lord for those days, but you can't go back and relive those days. This is one of the biggest challenges for churches, and it's one of the biggest challenges for individuals. We fail to put the past in its proper place. Either we let past failures talk smack to us, defeat us, hold us back, frighten us to the point that we don't try anything new for fear of failure, or we let past successes cause us to become too lazy, too complacent, too confident, too cocky, to the point that we rest on our laurels and settle for mediocrity as the norm. But my Bible says one thing I do, forgetting what is behind putting it in its proper place. Yes, I may have shared Christ yesterday, but did I pass up opportunities today that were clearly in front of me? Yes, I prayed yesterday, but have I prayed today? Yes, I read my Bible yesterday, but my Bible was available to read today. Have I read it? Yes, I prayed yesterday, but I'll have three hours on my drive home. I wonder if I'll pray any on the drive home tonight and spend some extra time with the Lord because He's given me that drive time. We shouldn't live in the past. I love what Rick Warren said. I was out at Saddleback Church in California for a conference, and he said it, and at first I thought, I like it, but I don't understand it. Let me throw it out at you, see if you get it. He said, if we're not living on the edge, we're taking up too much space. I had to think about that for a minute. And then I got what he meant. He's just saying, look, we need to go for it for the Lord. We don't need to live in fear. And we sure don't need to live in the past. If you've had a tough year in some area when it comes to your spiritual health, then give, it, give yourself some grace and whatever you do, don't give up. 
Don't give up. Failure is not final. If you've knocked it out of the park last year, then be humble, be helpful to others, and set some new goals. And knock it out of the park this year for the Lord's glory and for the help of the church. One key habit to having ongoing spiritual revival is release the past. Secondly, reach for the future. Reach for the future. Paul writes, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me upward. Now Paul's language makes me think, and I know I'm a little biased in this direction, so I admit it, but it makes me think that Paul might have been a runner. He might have been. He at least walked a lot, right? He got around. And he loved to spread the gospel. And so maybe he did some running from town to town so he could spread the gospel. Maybe he was a runner. He talks about uh, straining toward what is ahead. It's kind of that picture of muscles straining. Maybe he was a runner. I know from John 20 that Mary Magdalene was a runner. I know that the Apostle Peter was a runner and the Apostle John were runners. And I also know, because it says they ran to the tomb. Scripture says that. Read it for yourself. And I know that John and Peter were real men. Sometimes we put these guys up on a pedestal like they're superhuman. They're not superhuman. They served a superhuman God. They served the, the, the King of Kings and Lord of lords, and he did mighty things through their lives. What do you mean, preacher? Well, John and Peter ran to the tomb, but in John's gospel, since he's writing it, he tells you twice, not just once, he says twice, read it in John 20, that he was faster than Peter. You know, Peter's pretty fast, we were running, but the one whom Jesus loved got there first, and then he says he beat Peter to the tomb. That's what guys would do, wouldn't it? That's what I'd do if I was faster than you. I'd humbly brag to someone, you know, oh, well, you know, I I was a little bit faster than brother so-and-so. And And I'd work it in, and you'd work it in, and John worked it in. That's normal. Paul was intense. He was disciplined. He said, I press on toward the goal. The Greek word is the word skopos. It just means goal. It means goal marker. And so let me ask you a biblical question tonight. What are your goals? What are you aiming towards in this month? What are you aiming towards this year in your spiritual life? I've heard the saying, if you aim at nothing, you're probably going to hit it. So what are you aiming at in your Christian life? Let's pretend that ten aliens, well, that a spacecraft, all of a sudden we hear a commotion and all these bright lights. And I know you're thinking right now, where is this preacher going with this? But hang with me. This spacecraft lands out in the parking lot. Well, what are we going to do? I'm going to rush out there and see what's going on. Ten identical aliens walk off the spacecraft. Now, I don't believe in aliens or spacecrafts, but let's just pretend we all do, all right? And they walk off, and we say, let's have a little fun with these guys. And we take out a round sphere called a basketball. And we say, hey, you five greenies, you over here, you five with the big heads, we'd have to be sure we also said in green, because a lot of of us have big heads, so we don't want to get us mixed in. And so... You, you five greeny big head guys over here, you five over here. And we go back in the clothing closet and we find five blue shirts of various kinds. We put on the green guys over here and we find five red shirts and we put on the green guys over here and we tell them, now you're on one team, you all work together. You're on one team, you all work together. And we put them on a basketball court with two goals, one on each end. And we throw up the ball. What's going to happen? Well, I've never been to a game 
where 10 aliens have played, so I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe you have. And when you preach this sermon, you can tell us what really happened. But here's what might happen. I guess you throw it up, the ball will probably come back down and they'll realize, oh, that's the ball. And they see it bouncing. Maybe someone will grab it. They'll try to bounce it and realize, oh, that bounces. It comes back up. Maybe they'll throw it to another person on their team and it will become somewhat of a keep-away contest. I don't know. Do you think there's any chance that as they play keep away, they might accidentally throw it in the hoop? It's not probable, but it is possible, right? It, It could happen. But what if we told them, now the goal of this game is for you to put this ball through that round hoop on that end of the court. Will they shoot 60% from the field? Probably not. Will they shoot better than they would have if they had no clue that was the goal? You can be dead sure. If you aim at nothing, you're probably going to hit it. If you aim at something, you'll miss a lot. But failure is not final. And you'll hit it a lot more than if you did not. You set a goal to read 52 books this year, one every week. You may not read 52 books, but you might read 20 or 25 and read a lot more than you would have normally. You set a goal to read your Bible every day. You probably won't read it every day, but you'll probably read it a lot more days than you would have had you not set a goal. Goals are not unbiblical. Goals are biblical. And Paul says that he's aiming towards the goal. I've heard it said that it's not really a goal until you write it down. There's something about writing it down that makes it a goal that you're aiming at. Now I'm not talking about name it and claim it. I'm not talking about prosperity gospel or anything about like that. No, but I am saying that we need to name it. We need to say, Lord, with your help, I'm going to shoot for this. I've been doing that in the area of gospel witnesses, aiming for so many each week and so many each day. And I don't hit that all the time, but at least I'm aiming at something and at least I'm more aware now of opportunities because that's a goal I believe the Lord has laid on my heart. That's true in my spiritual reading of the Bible. I have a certain goal at which I'm aiming. That's true in my prayer life in other areas of life. I lose focus sometimes, like the night I walked into Wendy's after church and we went, wanted to go and eat a fine meal and so we thought we'd go to Wendy's and I thought, well, I'll just go in and freshen up before we order and I went in and freshened up. I, I, I didn't notice anything really different and when I came out, some crazy lady was trying to get in the door I was coming out. I thought, what's wrong with this woman? trying to get in the men's room. And then I got out of the way. She almost ran over me. I guess she really had to go or something. I didn't ask her. And then I turned around and noticed the word men was on that door, but there was a couple other letters in front of the word men. And then my mind pushed rewind, and I thought, oh, there were certain things not in that bathroom. It's normally in the men's bathroom. Now, what do you do if that happens? Do you never go in another Wendy's the rest of your life? Do you never eat another hamburger? Do you decide, well, I'm never going to go out in public again because I've obviously embarrassed myself? No, failure's not final. I didn't hit the goal that night because the goal was to go in the men's room. It certainly wasn't to go in the women's room. But I've never messed up in Wendy's again. I won't say that I haven't messed up again and maybe almost gone into a women's room. I did that at the KBC one time. But I caught it immediately and no women were walking out. I just caught it. I had a check in my spirit. Oops. And I fixed it and went into men's. Sometimes we lose focus but when we do, we just pick ourselves up where we are and we refocus. We keep moving forward. Notice one last healthy habit. Not only should we 
uh, release the past, not only should we reach for the future, but Paul says we should represent consistency. Consistency. Look how he puts it in verse 15. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things, and if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only live up to what we have already attained. Live up to what we've already attained. Paul is saying, some of you are mature, so act like it. Some of you are godly, so practice godliness. Some of you are spiritual, so be spiritual. Live up to what you are. Reach, represent consistency. Practice it. Be consistent. Consistency is the key in so many areas of life. Consistently investing in your retirement account. Consistently practicing spiritual disciplines. Consistently drinking more water. Consistently exercising a little each day. Consistently getting in bed on time. Consistently telling Brother Steve, he may be the greatest preacher you've ever had here for revival. And all your, oh, I just threw that in, sorry. Um, just a little joke there. Consistently leading to healthy, consistency leads to healthy habits. We need to represent consistency. We don't need to be hot and cold. You know what the Bible says about hot and cold and lukewarm. And God wants us to be hot all the time if we can. One of the things I love most about working at the KBC is knowing that I'm not there alone. Many times as a pastor you feel that way. It's not really true. You've got men and women of God who love you and love the Lord and are there for you. But there's times in the ministry that you feel somewhat alone. I never feel that at the KBC because I can always walk down the hall if they're in most of the time, we're not in, we're out. The work's not in Louisville, it's in Louisa, it's in Livingston, and other places around the state, and so we don't just sit at the office. But if I do need to talk to someone about something in life, I can probably go down a door or two, and there'll be some man of God there to whom I can share my heart. And he'll say, well, let's pray about that, Steve. and Let's think together on that. And I'll be praying with you this week as you wrestle through that, and I appreciate that. So very much. It reminds me of the out-of-towner, kind of a city guy who was out in the country, drove his car in a ditch uh, in the country. Luckily, a local farmer came to help with his big, strong horse named Buddy. He hitched Buddy up to the car that was in the ditch, and he yelled, Pull, Nellie, pull! Buddy didn't move. Then he yelled, Pull, Buster! Pull! Buddy didn't respond. Then he yelled, pull, Coco, pull. Nothing. Then the farmer nonchalantly said, almost in a whisper, pull, buddy, pull. And the horse easily dragged the car out of the ditch. The motors was extremely appreciative, of course, but very curious. He asked the farmer, why in the world did you call your horse by the wrong name three times? The farmer said, oh, buddy's blind. And if he thought he was the only one pulling, he wouldn't even try. <laughs> now look to your right. In some cases there's nobody over there, but a lot of times there are. Look to your right. Look to your left. You're not the only one pulling. You've got brothers and sisters in the Lord who love you, who love the Lord, and whatever you're going through, they'll go through it with you. It may be so private that you can't tell them what it is, but you can say, look, I've got something in my life, it's unspoken, will you pray for me? Will you walk with me? Pull, pull together, pull for the lost, pull for the church, pull for the glory of the Lord Jesus. I like that story. A lot of truth in that story. Appreciate that song about heaven. I like B.J. Thomas. I'm old enough to know who B.J. Thomas is. and Had one of his song books that included that one in it. Several other good ones. And boy, didn't he have such a smooth, just clear, beautiful voice. 
loved hearing him and had some recordings uh, of him. I appreciate that story about heaven and song about heaven. When I hear about heaven, I think of my grandparents. All of my grandparents are in heaven. My paternal grandfather uh, held out, though, late in life. Uh, his two half brothers, step brothers, were uh, old, regular, primitive Baptist preachers, and uh, they were always witnessing to him and trying to share with him. He just wouldn't have anything of it. And, uh, my grandmother, his wife, was very, very involved in in uh, in those churches, and and he just kind of uh, rebelled and would never come to Christ. After I was saved and then after I was called to preach, I had so, I loved my grandfather so much. He lived about a mile from our house, and I was up there all the time. I was like his shadow. And his name was Elmer, Papa Elmer to me, and I loved Papa Elmer so much. And had such a deep burden for him. And I tried meager efforts, tried on numerous occasions to share Christ. I can remember one day I worked through the the plan of salvation, and worked right up to that question where I asked, Papa, wouldn't you like to know for sure today that you're going to heaven? You know what he said? He didn't say a word. Total silence. I thought, well, he, he must not have heard me. And so I backed up and I took another run at it and said the same thing a different way and asked the same question a different way. And I said, Papa, wouldn't you like to know for sure today that you're going to heaven? Total silence. Not a word. Felt like such a failure. Kept praying for my papa. And thank God, late in life, some other preacher shared with my papa he came to know Christ. And yes, he wasted a lifetime. But God loved him and God was gracious. And God gave him eternity in heaven. And I miss my grandparents. I've talked about my dad. I wish I had more time to tell you about my mom. My mom passed away in 1992 at age 60. She had had a massive heart attack seven years earlier. She, we thought she was in pretty good health those next seven years, but then she had another, another massive heart attack at age 60. And she died quickly. My mom was a spitfire. You couldn't make her do anything. Now she would do anything in the world for you if you asked her nicely. And she'd do anything in the world for you probably if you didn't ask. But if you tried to make her do something, that wasn't going to happen. Maxine Rice wouldn't do it. And she loved the Lord. She was much more, no, no offense at all intended towards my dad, but she was much more mature believer then my dad, she had grown deeply in her faith and, and knew the Bible and knew how to serve faithfully uh, in the local church. Now my dad became a deacon and all that, but, but my mom was just deeper and you just, you just knew that by her life. And you know, I grieved my mom's passing for uh, a, a good season of life. I don't grieve anymore. Sometimes we... We mistake those two things. We mistake missing someone and grieving. You work through the grief process. So I no longer grieve, but I'll miss her the rest of my life. I'll miss the fact she doesn't know Jack Walker and miss the fact that she doesn't know Clark David. And miss the fact that she doesn't see me working at KBC and getting to come and preach at fine churches like this, being invited back. She would have been proud of that. And I miss mom. But I'm so grateful that my Bible teaches me that there is coming a day when I will see him face to face, not because I deserve it, but because he is gracious and I accepted what he did for me on the cross. And I am so thankful that the promise is there that I'll see my papa again. I'll see my grandparents again. And I'll see my mom again. And we'll have eternity together in the presence of the Lord.